Welcome back to the Doctor is in Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, I'd like to talk about one of my favorite issues in plastic surgery, eyelid rejuvenation. Many times people will come in, patients will come in and complain about their tired eyes or they feel that they're wide awake and they're feeling vibrant but their eyes look tired or people at work or their friends comment that perhaps they didn't get enough sleep last night or perhaps something's bothering them and when in fact they feel great but it's just the appearance of their eyes uh, bothers them. And of course we all, we've said for a long time that the eyes are the windows to the soul. Perhaps uh, more than any other part of the face, the eyes reveal expression and how we're feeling, and it conveys a lot of emotion and, in general, how we're doing, our energy level. The eyes convey that to people. So it's a very important area and one of my favorite areas in plastic surgery, especially for facial rejuvenation. The clean, crisp, uh, full eyelid can make a dramatic difference in both men and women. Now. I think it's important to emphasize, and you've heard me discuss this in different segments, that we need to take a custom-designed approach for everyone. Eyelid surgery is very much like other areas of plastic surgery. We cannot uh, offer a cookie-cutter approach to people. Uh, it's not the same for everyone. Everybody brings a different set of circumstances, a different appearance. Uh, your own eyelid, your own face is like a fingerprint. No one else has it. So a custom designed approach is what I believe in. You've heard me say that as we mature, we tend to lose fat in our face and in our hands and put on that weight in the trunk. It's an unhappy practical joke. That has effects for the eyebrow, the upper eyelid. It can, it can also uh, affect the lower eyelid, but in kind of a different way. Now, please keep that in mind. And of course, we want to keep in mind the triangle of beauty where we talk about the skin, that's number one. The second segment of the second corner of the triangle, that's volume, of course. That's vital. And you've heard me say we tend to lose fat from our face and in our hands and put it on in our trunk as we mature. It's an unhappy practical joke. And the third uh, the third part of the, the third corner of the beauty, the triangle of beauty, is the soft tissue position and the amount. That can be very important when we're thinking about the eyelids because there are many really key, important supporting structures of the eyelids, in particular the lateral cancel tendon. That's a little three-part tendon. It's like a ligament that supports the corner of the eye. That's ten that tends to get lax with time and with age. There's the medial cancel supporting ligament closer to the nose. There are supporting ligaments inside the muscle that elevates the upper lid called the, levator, the, the levator and the aponeurosis can get weak. The lower eyelids can get lax in the tone of the orbicularis muscle. The orbicularis oculi is a circular muscle. It's like a sphincter around the eyeball itself, encompassing both the upper lid and the lower lid. That muscle can lose tone, bringing on conditions like scleral show or actually ectropion. That's a sheepdog look. That's when the lower eyelid can get pulled down. So those are some principles that we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with the eyelid and eyelid rejuvenation and relieving tired eyes. There's another very important principle that I'd like to discuss and remind you about. Some of you have heard me say this. Whenever someone comes into my office to discuss their eyelids, we need to look at the adjacent structures. For example, for the upper eyelid, the eyebrow is key. The eyebrow is the roof of the upper eyelid. It's very important to look at the eyebrow and the upper eyelid uh, as a pair in conjunction with each other because it's an adjacent structure that can profoundly affect the way the upper eyelid looks. For the lower eyelid, it's the upper cheek and malar area. You've heard me talk about the high cheekbone or a cheekbone that's losing volume. We need to look at the foundation for the lower eyelid whenever someone comes in and says, well, I have bags under the eyes or, or excess skin or I have dark circles or my lower eyelids look so tired or even I feel like my eyelids are getting pulled down or they have dry eyes. So we need to look at adjacent structures. That's really key 
for any area of plastic surgery, of course. You've heard me talk about rejuvenating the abdomen. Someone might be interested in liposuction. We have to look at the adjacent skin, the overlying skin. We have to look at the underlying abdominal wall. So for high quality, safe, effective plastic surgery, examining and considering adjacent structures is key. So with that in mind, let's talk about the lower eyelid. Oftentimes people will come in and they'll complain about dark circles or the groove under the eye. That's called the tear trough or eyelid cheek junction. Sometimes people will complain about pouches. They feel with time that their upper cheek or the malar area is sort of deflating, but the lower eyelid shows more and more prominent pouches. And those issues are related. And again, people can complain about the position of their lower eyelid. It can tend to be pulled down. The lateral cancel tendons t tends to get lax and the corner of the eye can move closer to the, to the pupil or the cornea, the colored part, the iris. So those are all issues that we need to inspect. So again, key important high quality plastic surgery, we need to have an accurate and detailed knowledge of the anatomy. And the lower eyelid is very key, very important that we know the anatomy of the lower eyelid very accurately and that we go layer by layer and address each layer. Of course, there's the skin. Um, the skin needs to be properly moisturized. Uh, it can be affected by fine lines, dispigmentation, brown spots, brown patches, crepey skin. So the skin is very important. Next, we have to look at the muscular layer. That's the orbicularis oculi. There's another sphincter in the face nearby. That's the orbicularis oris. That's another sphincter around the lips that, that contracts the lips and help us, helps us to close the mouth. But the orbicularis oculi is the muscle right under the skin in the eyelid, both the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. Then, of course, there's the septum underneath the orbicularis muscle. The septum is a membrane. We can call that the orbital septum. Uh, orbital septum. It's like fascia. You've heard me talk about fascia. It's connective tissue, collagen. It can be very thin and delicate and wispy, like in the lower eyelid. Or it can be very robust and tough and thick, like a piece of leather, a leather belt. And we can see that type of fascia in the abdomen. But for the lower eyelid, we need to look at the skin. We need to, need to look at the orbicularis muscle. Then we need to check the tone of the orbital septum, which keeps the next layer in place, and that's the orbital fat. The orbital fat is really key um, for rejuvenating the lower eyelid. We don't uh, take a very aggressive approach to the skin of the, of, the, of the lower eyelid. Oftentimes, if we're too aggressive treating the skin of the lower eyelid, that can tend to give someone a tropion when the eyelid starts to pull down. I'm going to jump ahead and talk about the upper eyelid for a moment. The upper eyelid, it's the opposite. We're very conservative addressing the fat pockets at the upper eyelid and the lacrimal gland that makes the tears. That's because a full upper eyelid is really a youthful sign. It's a, it's a, a sign of attractiveness and a sign of beauty. So we'll get to the upper lid, but for now, keep in mind that we need to be very conservative when we're treating the skin of the lower eyelid. But we're much more, I'd say, interventional, much more invasive, much more aggressive when treating fat pouches or the fat in the lower eyelid. So what about the skin? An important concept we need to keep in mind is the eyelid cheek junction. Of course, everyone knows this is the cheek. This is the lower eyelid, of course. And the line in between, that margin, that's called the eyelid cheek junction. And when it gets deep, it's, it, we call it the tear trough. Um, commonly because if someone generates tears or cries, that little channel can be where the tears flow down the cheek. That's called the tear trough. Now, for the skin of the lower eyelid, I think it's really key uh, to avoid having that skin be dried out. Oftentimes people will come in and they'll be concerned about very fine lines, uh, crepey lower eyelid skin, when it's actually, and they think they need surgery, it's really because the skin is dried out. So we need to pay attention to the condition of the skin. And you've heard me talk about proper 
uh, skin care in the past. We need to avoid sun. We need to avoid smoking. We need to properly moisturize and cleanse. We need to exfoliate properly but not too aggressively. And we need to introduce a product that will regenerate. The baby cells, as we've talked about from the germinal matrix, when stimulated, take about 30 days to get to the top where you can see them. So number one, we need to take proper care of the skin and the eyelid skin can be um, inspected. When you come into the office, of course, we need to look very closely. Pigment changes can be difficult to deal with. There can be dispigmentation, there can be brown spots that we can treat with TCA peels, long-term skin care that you can do, some retinols can help, sometimes laser can help, but we need to be very conservative when treating the skin of the lower eyelid because it's delicate and if we're too aggressive with it, it can contract. Sometimes a patient does have excess skin and we will need to address that. We can, so we can do minimal tightening with retinols or TCA peels or laser. When there's lots of excess skin, we can redrape it, remove some, tighten up and firm it up. Now, the muscle can be affected. Sometimes people get an over-exuberant or a muscular ridge of the orbicularis, and that can be easily taken care of by trimming it. Uh, next is the orbital septum. Sometimes I can go in and score the orbital septum with an electrocautery. It's like a laser, and we can strengthen it, and thereby the fat pads, those three pouches, can be held in place. Now, what about those all-important fat pouches in the lower eyelid that make some people look so tired. That's actually fat. And please keep in mind that the globe or the eyeball has these fat pockets that cushion and lubricate the globe. And they're designed to be there. However, everyone has far too much fat. We have much more than we need it there uh, cushioning and lubricating the globe. That fat is held in place by an orbital septum. It's a membrane that I talked about. In some families, that orbital septum gets weak and it allows the fat to kind of push through. It's actually called a pseudo herniation, and that's what we call it uh, for the lower eyelid and the upper eyelid. When people have excessively puffy lids, it can be from fluid, but more often it's from the fat pockets in the lower eyelid. Now, let me make an important point. If someone notices that in the morning when they get up, their eyelids seem puffy, and towards the end of the day after they're upright for many hours, they don't seem so puffy anymore, certainly we're not going to treat that with surgery. We're going to talk to them about the fluid cycle and how much salt in their diet, what kind of food, and perhaps propping up the bed just a little bit at night. There are other treatments that we can do that are non-surgical. But when those fat pockets start to push through the orbital septum, that pseudo herniated fat, uh, we can treat that quite well surgically. Now, one way can, we can do that is with surgery, plastic surgery, the external approach, or there's the internal approach called the transconjunctival method. So I'll go over both of those briefly, and then I want to talk about filler and Botox and sometimes your own fat to uh, treat the lower eyelids in a much less invasive way. But certainly, when there are very prominent excess fat pouches, one way to treat that is by going onto the inside of the lower eyelid, not the eyeball, but the inside of the lower eyelid. It's called the transconjunctival approach. So there's no scars, no incisions on the outside. What I like to do, especially when there's a very full lower eyelid and there's a full cheek, but we have that tear trough, what I like to do is to restore a smooth eyelid cheek junction. That's an important concept for us to emphasize. A representation of beauty, you can pick up any glamour magazine, you can walk down Alvarado Street or Fifth Avenue in New York and look at a mannequin, and the eyelid cheek junction is very smooth. We like to smooth that out. No one has the type of airbrushing that you see in the glamour magazines, and no one has that sort of plastic look where there's a straight shot or a straight line between the eyelid and the cheek, but that's a cartoon or kind of characterization. It's a mannequin. It's a representation of an attractive eyelid, attractive face, it's, but it's like a cartoon representation. But we do want to keep in mind that when there's that prominent groove between the eyelid and the, low, and the upper cheek, that's called the tear trough, and that's the eyelid cheek junction, a prominent eyelid cheek junction. So we want to try to smooth that out. 
So getting back to the transconjunctival approach, we can go on the inside of the lower eyelid. I make an incision right on that orbital rim, right on that, right, just right under that tear trough. And instead of taking out fat and throwing it away, I can redrape that fat over the lower eyelid. There's a sort of a, a more modern movement in plastic surgery for eyelid surgery, upper eyelids, lower eyelids, for the nose. Instead of just taking away skin and fat and cutting it out and throwing it away, we like to reposition, reposition to a more attractive position, a more youthful position to maintain a sense of fullness. Because oftentimes, I think in years past, too much skin would be removed and too much fat would be taken. And not long after lower eyelid surgery with that older method, uh, people might have a sallow look or kind of a hollow eye look. We want to try to avoid that. So I can go on the inside of the lower eyelid. It's called the transconjunctival approach. I can release some of that orbital septum, release the deep tear trough, some of the orbicularis muscle, and we can transpose those fat pouches over the rim to fill in that groove. And so then we can have a smoother eyelid cheek junction that's full because a full eyelid area and a full, you've all heard the expression, high cheekbones. We need volume there. We, if we're losing fat, then we don't want to take away even more fat. So that's called the transconjunctival, transconjunctival approach. Let me back up for a moment. You've heard me say many times that as we mature, we lose fat in the face and in the hands and put on weight in the trunk. What happens in the mid face, the cheek here, in the malar area, the high cheekbone area, and below the lower eyelid, as we lose fat there, it tends to deflate a little bit. And then we get something called mid face descent, where this cheek area and the mid face can actually be pulled on by gravity. And that can make that tear trough uh, much more prominent and deeper as the tissue is pulled down. It's tethered there, whereas the eyelid is free, the cheek is free, but it's tethered there right to the bone at that orbital septum. It's called the arcus marginalis, or orbital septum, right on the arcus. And so as we lose volume in the mid-face, lose volume in the cheek, it allows gravity to pull down. There's, called, there's something called mid-face descent, and it makes the lower eyelid look tired and can deepen that tear trough. And so sometimes, not every time, but sometimes I will recommend to a person to have a mini cheek elevation uh, in addition to lower eyelid surgery. Or oftentimes, if we elevate the upper cheek or revolumize the cheek, a person won't need a lower eyelid surgery. So keep in mind, uh, we can talk about that in consultation. And there's lots of ways to do a mini cheek lift. Typically, I go through the hair and the temple and slip down through a little incision, fiber optic lighting, and loop magnification to elevate the, the cheek area or the malar area. Many ways to do that. So I talked about the transconjunctival approach to treating pouches. What about the external approach? When someone has lots of redundant skin, then I will typically make a little incision underneath the lower eyelid eyelashes because it tends to be almost invisible in a few months. Then I can remove skin that way. I can slip in under the muscle. I can make a dissection over the muscle for a short distance and then slip in through the orbital septum and get to the fat patches. And then, and then the same type of procedure. I can remove some fat. I can sculpt the fat. I can score the orbital septum with a little electrocautery. I can transpose the fat over the orbital rim. So those are all steps we can take to help rejuvenate the lower eyelid. Now, what can we do even before surgery? Sometimes people come in with tired looking eyes. And of course, we need to talk to them about skin care. But if they have relatively prominent tear troughs and they're not ready for surgery, I oftentimes will recommend a filler or fat grafting. Now, how is it that a filler can have the, can, can give the appearance of a much smoother eyelid cheek junction? Well, we talked about how the eye, lower eyelid can be prominent like a hill, the cheek can be prominent like a mountain, and the tear trough is like a valley. It's a groove in between the hill and the mountain. Well, instead of shaving down the hill or shaving down the mountain, we can fill in that groove, fill in the tear trough with a filler. I typically like to use a very light filler like a Bellotera or, or uh, Vol Volbella, something very fine, different than a very heavy filler like a Voluma. 
So in the office, it's called a lunchtime treatment. The filler comes in a sterile syringe, and we can fill in that little area, fill in that tear trough. Or sometimes people elect to have fat grafting. Fat grafting is that process where I do a little bit of conservative liposuction. We spin the fat down, decant it, preserve it, keep it sterile, and then we can re-inject it into certain areas for higher cheekbones into the tear trough to bring the chin forward. Large volumes, we can bring the breasts uh, more forward, make the breasts bigger, uh, make the buttocks fuller, etc. So that's how we use fillers to rejuvenate the lower eyelid. Now what about Botox? I will oftentimes use Botox for hyperactive orbicularis muscles in the lower eyelid. I can use Botox on the sides of the eyes to lessen the so-called smile lines or crow's feet. When we discuss the upper eyelid and the lateral brow, I'm going to talk about how we use Botox to give a little bit of a lateral brow elevation. I think I'll save that for the next segment. I hope you'll stay tuned. Once again, this is the Doctor Is In Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. I hope you stay with us. It's scary making the, the decision to have um, reconstructive surgery, but it's so worth what you get out of it. I'm stress-free. I know I'm not going to get breast cancer. Everything is back to normal, and it really did not take long to bounce back. I have a, a sense of hope for other women that this surgery can help them to live normal lives. This year, more than 200,000 women in this country will be diagnosed with breast cancer. For many of them, a mastectomy, or removal of the affected breast, will be recommended as part of the cancer treatment. The idea of losing a breast for some women can be almost as difficult as being diagnosed with breast cancer. Modern breast reconstruction can help. The purpose of this presentation is to provide women with valuable information about the major issues in breast reconstruction. We'll have an opportunity to speak with women who chose different methods of reconstruction. We'll talk to experts in the field of breast cancer, and we'll let you know your options for breast reconstruction. I embraced the mastectomy and reconstruction procedure, and because of that, I had a terrific outcome, and it's changed my life in a positive way. For the thousands of women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year, we understand this is most likely a troubling and frustrating time. We hope this presentation's been valuable to you and will help you make some very difficult decisions that you're facing. Welcome back to the Doctor Is In Television program. I am Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. Thank you very much for joining me. I'd like to continue our discussion in this segment about eyelid rejuvenation and rejuvenation of the periorbital area. That means rejuvenating and making the area around the eyeball and eyelids and the whole orbit look and work better. It's very key. The eyelids, as we said in our last segment, convey lots of emotion. And just by looking at someone's eyelids and peering into their eyes tells a lot about how someone is feeling. And so it's very important. Uh, and one of my favorite areas in plastic surgery, it's very important to have the eyelids looking their best. So we started to talk about the lower eyelids in the last segment. I talked about a smooth eyelid cheek junction. Uh, oftentimes the puffiness or pouches that persist in the lower eyelid uh, can make a person look tired. There's the tear trough, the eyelid cheek junction. We, what we want is to have a smooth eyelid cheek junction. When there's that groove or prominent tear trough, whether it's from pigment changes or whether it's from the light being caught and casting shadows because of a groove, because of prominent fat pouches, or because the upper cheek is losing volume and starting to pull down. That's called mid-face descent. Those are all issues to making the lower eyelid look tired. As I said, we don't always rejuvenate the lower eyelids with surgery. We have good skin care. We can give you agents such as retinol. Sometimes we use agents to help minimize dark circles or pigment changes or dispigmentation, dispigmenta dispigmentation like a, cl a clearing solution or a hydroquinone or a bleaching solution, etc. Very conservatively. We need to be very conservative in treating.
treating the, when we're treating the delicate lower eyelid skin. I talked about using fillers to fill in the tear trough. Uh, right in the office, we can oftentimes rejuvenate the lower lid. I talked a little bit about using fat grafting, which is another way to replace volume. And of course, I talked about surgery, lower eyelid surgery called blepharoplasty. The two most common methods are the transconjunctival approach. That's where I go on the inside of the lower lid and I can uh, reposition the fat. I can take away some fat. I can smooth out that eyelid cheek junction. Or there's the external approach. When someone has lots of extra skin, uh, I can treat the redundant skin by removing sun, removing sun some, and that's by making a little incision just under the eyelashes, just under the lid margin, and that tends to be very inconspicuous within a few weeks. So to continue our discussion, what about pre uh, procedures for the lower eyelid? There's something really important to talk about, and that's a lateral canthopexy or a lateral canthoplasty. With time, uh, as we mature, the lateral canthal mechanism, the lateral canthal tendon tends to get elongated and lax, and thereby that corner of the eye tends to slide down lower and closer to the uh, closer to the nose, closer to the closer to the colored part of the eye. That's the lateral canthal mechanism here, and that palpebral 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 angle, that fissure there, that opening can be changed, and there's a profound difference if you look at a young person and, a, and an older person, the way that angle looks and how the lateral canthal uh, mechanism and tendon is supporting, especially the lower eyelid. To a certain degree, the upper eyelid in its position, but profoundly affects the lower eyelid position. So oftentimes, I will go in with a little surgical procedure to do a canthopexy. That's where I shorten that, that retaining ligament, shorten the lateral canthal tendon, Sometimes we do a canthoplasty where we actually transpose it or move it or totally reconstruct it. What that does is to improve the tone and support for the lower lid. You can do a little bit of an exercise in the mirror. If you take a Q-tip, sometimes your finger, if you take something safe to go near your eye, and if you just transpose the corner of your eye, if you just transpose and mimic shortening the supporting mechanism, shortening the lateral canthal tendon, oftentimes your, your lower eyelid will look more refreshed. It'll look smoother so and more rejuvenated, and the eyelid cheek junction will be much smoother. So that's a, a bit of a way that we can mimic uh, what a lateral canthopexy or canthoplasty can do for people. Now, of course, I think it's very important to emphasize once again that in any eyelid surgery, or any eyelid rejuvenation, even if it's fillers, we need to consider adjacent structures. For the upper lid, we need to think about the brow. For the lower lid, we need to think about the upper cheek, especially the malar area. Now, even before we consider surgery, we need to look at volume changes. Oftentimes, making the cheekbone or the, or the cheek or the zygomatic area more prominent with a filler, a heavy filler, such as voluma, or even fat grafting, um, plus minus a little mini cheek elevation. If I make a little incision in the hair of the temple and elevate that area and improve the support, just by elevating the cheek, it improves the support for the lower eyelid and can dramatically improve the way the eyelid looks. To minimize the lower eyelid cheek junction, uh, that's a, again, that's a really key concept in the attractive face and the attractive eyelid to look at the eyelid cheek junction. We want to minimize that and have it be as smooth as possible. So in summary, we've talked about a lot of issues. We need to look at the skin. We need to look at dark circles. Is it pigment? Is it blood vessels? Is it something that we can treat with laser or TCA peels or long-term skincare programs that you can do in addition to taking care of your own uh, skin? Uh, what about the skin itself? Are there fine lines? Is the skin dried out? Is there an excess of skin? Is the skin lax? Is it out of position? Do we need to surgically reposition it? Do we need to look at the lateral canthus? What about the tear trough? What about that eyelid cheek junction? Can we treat it with fillers? Can we do that with an injection? Will fat grafting help? Or do we recommend surgery, a surgical procedure that oftentimes can be done in the office? The external approach can help us or facilitate removal of skin, the internal or transconjunctival approach 
is a great way to reposition the fat pouches, remove some fat, smooth out that eyelid cheek junction to give a much more rejuvenated look, and there's no scars on the outside. Now, what about the upper eyelid? Once again, I'm going to emphasize that we need to look at adjacent structures. We must look at the position and the projection of the eyebrow, especially the lateral brow, when we're doing any analysis of the upper lid. Now, I've talked a lot about the fat pouches of the lower lid and how we're very, very conservative with the skin and we're likely to be much more aggressive by treating the fat pouches. I'd say, in summary, uh, we're, it's just the opposite with the upper lid. We're much more aggressive treating the upper eyelid skin and we're very, very conservative with treat, treating upper eyelid pouches. Now, let's say someone comes in and they say their, eye, their upper eyelids seem heavy. Uh, they seem like they're puffy, not just in the morning, but throughout the day. Again, if someone tells me that their eyelids are puffy in the morning, but as the day wears on and they're upright, they lose that puffy appearance, well, it's probably fluid and we're probably not going to recognize surgery. We're going to recommend other things to minimize puffiness, like salt intake in your diet, keeping your head up, cold packs, etc. So, but the eyelid skin can be addressed easily for the upper eyelid with something called a blepharoplasty. It's, it's traditionally called an eyelid tuck or upper blepharoplasty. It can be done in the office. Um, we tend to be conservative, but what we do want to do typically is have a full eyelid. We want to have the brow in proper position. When it needs to be addressed, I will address the pouches in the upper eyelid. Keep in mind, the lower eyelid and the upper eyelid have three compartments. In the lower eyelid, it's all fat. The nasal compartment, central compartment, and lateral compartment. There are three compartments in the upper lid as well. They're analogous structures. The levator muscle in the upper lid is it has an analogous structure to the lower lid, the capsule palpebral fascia and the lid retractor. They're just analogous structures embryologically. So for the upper eyelid, the medial compartment or the nasal compartment is fat. The central compartment is fat. Now the lateral compartment we need to be very careful about for a number of reasons. First of all, we desire a full lateral eyelid with the lateral brow in proper position. And there is some fat there, <coughs> excuse me. However, the lacrimal gland is in the lateral compartment of the upper lid. And we will sometimes reposition the lacrimal gland in the outer or lateral compartment, but we don't want to be removing that. We don't want to remove some of it. We don't want to take a chance in giving someone a dry eye. So very conservative addressing surgically the lateral compartment. In the medial compartment or nasal compartment, we can conservatively trim that fat, reposition it, remove it. The central compartment, sometimes we can address that if needed. The lateral compartment, there's some fat there, but keep in mind we need and desire a full lateral orbital area. So there's another structure deeper, as I said before, that's the levator muscle. And when there's dysfunction in that muscle, typically it sometimes can get hyperactive and have upper lid have upper lid retraction, things like hyperthyroidism. But oftentimes that aponeurosis or the insertion of the muscle where it becomes thin can get stretched out or weak and thereby giving somebody someone ptosis. That's tip, typically called a lazy eyelid. That's when the eyelid itself, the position comes down towards the pupil. And that's a visual field obstruction that can be covered by insurance. That's a surgical medical indication, typically re uh, covered by insurance, reconstructive surgery to shore up that muscle, shorten it, imbricate it, sometimes remove some of the aponeurosis to get the, eye to get the eyelid in a much better position. So we can be much more aggressive with the skin of the upper eyelid to help deepen the crease or restore a crease. We can conservatively address the fat compartments. I did talk about lateral canthi, lateral canto, lateral canthopexy, and lateral canthoplasty dramatically affecting the lower eyelid. It can have a more subtle change for the upper eyelid. And of course, there's a medial canthus as well. And those issues, <laughs> we could take an hour and talk about those issues as well.
but I do want to take a couple of minutes to address the all-important brow position when we're considering or evaluating the upper eyelid. The upper brow, or I should say the upper eyelid, has a root, and that is the eyebrow. So we need to examine and look at those structures together. Oftentimes someone will feel that their crease of the upper eyelid is being covered or it's being hidden, and they have excess skin or excess fat. But what it really is, when they're examined, is that the brow has come down. Once again, as we mature, we lose fat in our face, in our hands, and we gain weight in our trunk. And we certainly lose some resilience in the supporting structures. There are some supporting structures around the orbit. I talked about the lateral canthus and the medial canthus. There are some structures that support the position of the eyebrow, and as we lose volume, the brow can descend. It's interesting, however, that if we study photographs of people as they mature, oftentimes the medial eyebrow will go up and the lateral eyebrow will go down. So what do we do about uh, eyebrow descent? One of my favorite procedures in the office to do is a micro or mini Botox lateral brow lift. Now, how do we do that? Well, we know that there are three major depressors of the eyebrow, the corrugators, the procerus muscle, and the orbicularis oculi muscle. There's one major elevator of the lateral brow and of the eyebrow, that's the frontalis muscle. That's how we get forehead line. With Botox, which is a muscle relaxant, we can selectively get the depressors to relax and we can selectively al allow a part of the elevator to take over so we can actually help shape the brow. You know, all the models uh, that we see in the Glamour magazines, especially for the classic female attractive brow, there's a gentle slope upward to about the junction uh, at the corner of the eyeball, or corner of the orbit. That's the junction between the middle third and the lateral third. We like that to be peaked, and then the brow can continue horizontally, sometimes come down just a little bit, but if the brow in a, in a woman is horizontal or the lateral brow comes down, that tends to be very heavy. And it's kind of a tired masculine look. And it mimics or it gives the appearance that there's too much eyelid skin when in fact it's the brow that has come down. So by selectively letting the elevator work, the frontalis muscle, and selectively getting the depressors to relax with Botox, I can do a subtle, uh, micro or mini lateral brow elevation. Now, what about when people have a profound lateral brow uh, descent? That's a brow lift, and I can do a brow lift many different ways. I can make a little incision within just at the junction of the eyebrow itself and the forehead skin. I can make an incision at the hairline. I can make an incision uh, in the hair bearing scalp. I can use a little endoscope. Uh, I can use a mini incision and use fiber optic lighting and loop magnification. I can use a fiber optic retractor. There's all kinds of ways uh, to get in and elevate that tail of the brow to a more proper position. Sometimes it requires a little bit of skin removal. Sometimes just repositioning to a more functional or attractive position. But again, the lateral brow position is key when we're evaluating the upper eyelid. Sometimes just by revolumizing, because what we want to do is have a projecting eyebrow and forehead area. You will notice that oftentimes when people mature, I think particularly women, they will lose volume in the temples, and that allows once again gravity to pull down on structures. And so oftentimes just by revolumizing, instead of taking away tissue, we sometimes will just want to revolumize sometimes just reposition the tissue. Keep in mind, you've heard me use this analogy before. There's the grape and there's the raisin. We all in, in California love the sun. And there's the plum and there's the prune. What, look at, just picture in your mind what happens as the grape loses volume, it becomes more like a raisin. As a plum loses volume, it becomes more like a prune. So instead of pulling skin, instead of stretching and cutting it out, let's revolumize, let's do lift and fill. That's what, I can, that's what I call volumetric facial rejuvenation. So we've talked about a lot of things um, around the orbit, around the eyeball. We've talked about how important the 
how important the eyebrow position is for the upper lid. We talked about the lateral canthus. We talked about being a little more aggressive for the upper eyelid skin. We talked about being very conservative for upper eyelid fat. And we tend to leave alone the lacrimal gland because we want a full lateral compartment. We want that to be full and well-defined. For the lower eyelid, we talked about the lateral canthus. We talked about the skin. We talked about fat pouches and redraping fat pouches. We talked about preserving volume, saving volume, instead of just removing things. The eyelid cheek junction is really key. What we want is a smooth eyelid cheek junction. We don't want a really deep tear trough or groove. We talked some about the skin. We talked about pigment changes, dark circles. All these things are components of a proper, thorough eyelid evaluation that we do in the office. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon. If you want any more information about anything to do with eyelid surgery or eyelid rejuvenation or perioral rejuvenation, I hope you go to my website, www.drmorwood.com, or call the office, 831-646-8661. Once again, this is the Doctor Is In television program. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. Here in California, we all love the outdoors. Golf, tennis, going to the beach. However, the sun can play havoc with the delicate skin on the back of the hands and neck. Call or click today to learn the newest methods for restoration and beautification of the hands, neck, and other areas affected by the sun. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. One of the common goals I share with my patients is that they look not... Dr. Morwood made me feel really comfortable. His staff is phenomenal. Going into his office is always a great experience. Call or click today to learn how our combined approach of art and science can enhance your natural beauty. Hello, I'm Dr. David Morwood. I have over 25 years experience in plastic surgery. A smooth, firm neckline is a universal sign of beauty in both women and men. Dr. Morwood not only helped me regain my confidence, he helped me achieve the best version of me. Call or click today to learn how the natural neck lift can rejuvenate your beautiful neck and jawline. Welcome back to the Doctor Is In television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon here in beautiful Monterey, California. Thank you very much for joining us. In this next segment, I'd like to talk about gynecomastia or enlarged male breasts. This is one of those issues where I think so many men are concerned about this. Many are reluctant to come forward. It bothers them a great deal. It can bother adolescents. In school, it can bother uh, guys who are athletic and youthful. It can bother older men. It's a very common condition. Once again, it's called gynecomastia. It's the abnormal enlargement of the male breast tissue. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that men have breasts. Men have breast tissue that's normal and natural. And, of course, there's the pectoralis muscles, the big fan-shaped muscles on the front of the chest. Uh, that's desirable for many weightlifters. Uh, if you look at the statues of the Roman warriors and the Greek uh, gods, a well-defined chest for men can be a sign of masculinity. It's very attractive. So it's normal to have some breast tissue. It's normal in some men to have relatively prominent nipples, and that's okay. And it's normal to have well-developed pectoralis muscles and that's probably desirable. However, if the nipples are too prominent, if the breast tissue that's there naturally becomes enlarged, well then many, many men are uncomfortable with that feeling, they're uncomfortable with that look. I see a fair number of adolescents in high school or even earlier who are very concerned when they, when they have that adolescent gynecomastia, that's abnormal development of the breast tissue in the young man or, or boy and that can be treated, rest assured. I see this as well persisting into uh, men in their 30s and 40s. 
and I see it in more mature men, more senior citizens, where with change in their bodies, change in hormones, change in their exercise levels, change in their weight, they get more prominent breast tissue. And as you've heard me say, a custom designed approach is key. I may treat an adolescent who is bothered by gynecomastia in a very different way than I might uh, a 75 year old man who has noticed that with time he's, he has more prominent breast tissue. Custom designed approach, every client gets a different approach, every customer gets a custom evaluation and every patient is treated as an individual. I think that's really a key concept in my practice and for any plastic surgeon who's board certified offering a high quality service. What we wanna do is treat individuals. So what about the treatment of gynecomastia? It's very common, as I said. I see it in adolescents. I see it in 30 and 40 year old guys. I see it in senior citizens. Now, it's very important that we analyze what's going on. In many adolescents, it's just the breast tissue itself. Just because of hormone changes, and oftentimes many of us in adolescence, men and women, are affected by some hormone imbalances and some hormone changes. Different parts of our body gets ahead of the other part, and that can result in in a boy or young man that's very self-conscious about appearance. I, I see patients that have uh, applied ice packs to their chest before they go to school. I see patients who wear a band. I see boys who won't take their shirt off in gym class or they won't go to swim class because they're very self-conscious about their gynecomastia and they get teased and sometimes bullied. And we want to discourage that, but of course, if there's a condition that we can treat, we want to be able to offer that. I would say it's important that the pediatrician evaluate someone, evaluate a boy or a young man who is concerned with gynecomastia. It's rare, but on occasion we will see someone who needs some hormone rebalancing who's affected by that. Especially, um, I would say, if it's painful and tender, uh, it's always a good idea to have the pediatrician examine uh, a boy who's having some hormone issues or is concerned about their abnormally uh, sized breasts. But typically, there's no hormone imbalance to be treated. But what we need to look at is the breast tissue, if there's fat there, if there's abnormal, abnormally enlarged breast tissue, and is there any extra skin. And I would say that's a pretty good uh, way that we analyze, no matter what the age is, for a person, for a male, a man concerned with gynecomastia. We need to look at the skin. Is there excess skin? Is there excess fat? Is there excess breast tissue? And the, the other component to look at, particularly in the more uh, mature man, is the inframammary fold. Uh, as you know, under the pectoralis muscle, there's a groove or a fold. Of course, in women, that's a profoundly developed fold that is an actual structure where the breast mount itself can actually hang over or cup over the inframammary fold. That's a real structure. Now, it, it's also a real structure in the man, but it's not anywhere near as developed. However, if the breast tissue or the breast in a man is enlarged enough and there is a very firm or well-developed well inframammary fold, oftentimes the breast tissue will actually hang over or cup over that inframammary fold, the inframammary tethering ligaments and structures. And so we need to keep that in mind. In general, when we do body contouring for tummy tucks or we're considering the thigh, considering the breast, considering the arms, etc., there's the closed approach and then there's the open approach. What's the closed approach? The closed approach is essentially liposuction. Even though we can vacuum out breast tissue itself with a cannula, it's very similar to vacuuming out uh, fat cells. So I can make very small incisions, typically one in the armpit. Sometimes, not all the time, we make an incision in the inframammary fold itself, uh, typically laterally or towards the arm. Uh, I would say on occasion I make an incision infraperiorelar. In other words, the nipple, we all know what that is, the areola or areola, that's the tan part around the nipple. There's a junction where the tan part becomes the skin. 
I can make a pretty inconspicuous incision at that junction and thereby slip in and take out some of that breast tissue, the breast bud, right under the nipple areola complex. Uh, and sometimes through that approach, if I make a circular incision, I can remove some skin. However, typically with the closed approach to treatment of gynecomastia, it's one incision in the armpit, sometimes an incision at the side. And I can introduce the cannula. It's a tube. We connect it to a vacuum, or sometimes I do this manually in the office, and I can vacuum out and I can mold and shape and tailor, removing that extra fat, removing that extra breast tissue with very small incisions. Oftentimes, even if there is breast tissue that is difficult to come out with the liposuction cannula, I can use something that's called an alligator forceps. It's a very long instrument that I can slip in through the armpit and it has some jaws and I can actually pull out some, to some degree, tear, not tear out, but I can snip and cut that tough breast tissue underneath an areola and underneath the nipple without making an incision in the infraperiolar area. Sometimes men don't want an incision or a scar right under the nipples or on the anterior chest, but they will accept the scar towards the armpit or at the fold. So a combination of liposuction cannulas, sometimes the alligator forceps, it, I can often use something called the tendon retriever that we borrow from hand surgery. It's a very long instrument with a handle. There's like alligator clips, alligator forceps on the end, alligator jaws, that I can pass the tendon retriever from the armpit or the side to that area of the tough breast tissue and remove breast tissue directly. Oftentimes I'll do that right in the office. We give people an oral sedative pills, we can give a guy uh, a more relaxant, and we can numb up the skin with a local anesthetic, then I can put in Hunstead's formula, I can numb up that tissue, the excess fat and the excess breast tissue, and vacuum it out, mold and shape and tailor while a, while a guy is relaxed, but numb in the office. So that's the closed approach. Now what about the open approach? Just like in tummy tucks, when there is a lot of excess skin, we need to make incisions. And there's all kinds of different approaches for the excess skin of gynecomastia. Very similar to when a woman wants a mastopexy or a breast reduction. There's sometimes just incisions circular where the areola turns, uh, where the tan skin turns pale. There's sometimes a so-called lollipop incision where we make a tennis racket incision where we make an, a circular incision and then one up and down. And sometimes I'll actually make an incision in the inframammary fold itself. That's for more profound cases of excess skin, or I should say when there's a more profound excess of skin. Again, everyone's different. I sometimes will use a combination approach, suctioning, uh, removing the excess fat, uh, removing the excess breast tissue. If there's lots of extra skin, I will need to make an incision. And again, there's that peri-areolar peri approach. I can use the tendon retriever. I can use the uh, alligator forceps to take out some of that tough tissue. So um, as I said, for typically for the adolescent or for the young man or male adolescent, it's almost always the closed approach. Minimal scars, typically one in the armpit. For the guys who are more mature, maybe 30, 40, Again, almost always these guys will need just the closed approach, not lots of incisions. Now, what I did talk about the inframemory fold when it's very well defined, when the breast tissue seems to sort of fall over that, when the inframemory fold is really well defined, almost stuck, and the breast tissue falls over that, what about treating that? I can oftentimes do that with a liposuction cannula as well. It's not vacuuming out the inframemory fold, but I can oftentimes break it up. It needs to be numbed up, of course, but again, we can break up those areas of adherence. There are certain areas of the body, for example, on the back of the elbow, the inframemory fold, actually the, the tear trough where the eyelid, uh, eyelid is adherent actually to the orbital rim, that eyelid cheek junction. There are the, at the knee, there are these areas where the skin is tethered to the deeper tissues in the bone by tethering ligaments. 
um, those can be those can be disrupted and I can do that with a liposuction cannula I won't always need to go in and open that area up so for the adolescent young male it's almost always treated with a closed approach we can numb you up in the office if you want a whiff of anesthesia we can do that at the surgery center or hospital but it's almost al almost always treated with the closed approach with the cannula for the older gentleman 30s 40s We'll oftentimes do the closed approach. Sometimes I'll use the tendon passer or alligator forceps to take out additional breast tissue. I'd say less often I'll make an incision underneath the areola. Sometimes for those gentlemen, I'll need to break up the incrementally fold. For the more mature gentleman who has a lot of extra skin, we just need to, we need to remove it. So it's a combination typically of a closed approach where I suction the excess fat, suction the breast tissue, and remove skin. Everyone's different. Everyone presents with a different scenario, and we need to talk about goals and realistic expectations, et cetera. I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk about where we do gynecomastia surgery and the postoperative care. We offer two essential choices. For people who are capable of relaxing, you can come into the office and take pills. You can take an oral sedative. That's a pill. We don't start an IV. You can take an oral sedative. Typically, something like, like a volume, we can give you a narcotic, we can give you a Benadryl, some pain medicine, the narcotic that I mentioned, uh, and Tylenol. We let that soak in and take effect so people get very mellow. And then I can use a local anesthetic, a combination of a short anesthetic like lidocaine combined with something like a long anesthetic like marcaine to numb up the skin where I'm going to like make the little mini incision. Then I put in something called Hunstead's formula. It's a very dilute local anesthetic with something called epinephrine that will help vasoconstrict and minimize bleeding. We let that soak in, and so then a man or a boy will end up to be very mellow, numb, but they're awake. And oftentimes people prefer, pre, they prefer this because they're avoiding an anesthetic. Typically the cost is shorter, you don't have to drive to somewhere and park at the hospital, etc. So it can be done in the office for someone who is capable of relaxing and they have no medical problems, no uncontrolled medical problems. The second level, of course, is the surgery center or the hospital. They start an IV, they can give you those same medicines through the vein if you don't want to hear anything, if you don't want to see a needle, if you don't want to if you don't want to have any discomfort at all except for the IV being started. That's a good option. You can go to the hospital or surgery center, then numb you up and do the procedure. Postoperative care is very important. I think it's important to wear a wrap. It's like a weightlifter's um, wrap around the pectoralis area for three to six weeks. I think that's really important to give people your final result. If you're interested in gynecomastia treatment or any other issue in plastic surgery, I hope you go to my website, www.drmorwood.com, or call my office, 831 646-8661. Once again, this is the Doctor is in Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood, and the Doctor is in Television program. Thank you very much for being here.